कभी पल को पे आंसू है कभी लब पे शिकायत है मगर जिंदगी फिर भी मुझे तुझ से मोहब्बत है कभी पल को पे आंसू है कभी लब पे शिकायत है मगर जिंदगी फिर भी मुझे तुझ से मोहब्बत है कभी पल को पे आंसू है जो आता है वो जाता है ये दुनिया आनी जानी है यहाँ हर शहर मुसाफिर है सफर में जिंदगानी है उजालों की जरूरत है अंधेरा मेरी किस्मत है कभी पल को में आंसू है कभी लब पे शिकायत है मगर जिंदगी फिर भी मुझे तुझ से मोहब्बत है कभी पल को पे आंसू है Resilience can be learned. Resilience is the ability to adapt well to adversity. However, being resilient does not mean that we don't have trouble. Or distress. You will still have the tools to be able to find that interpretation in a positive way. Dr. Ginsburg has identified seven tools of resilience. Dr. Nelson Brown, resilience isn't a simple one part entity, which is exactly what Nani Richard is trying to do within the Caucasian diaspora. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As I and Rani Bhattacharya extend a very warm welcome to this gripping and fascinating session with two of our extremely informed and enlightened panelists today. Our first panelist is a lady known for her grit and determination to bring a change in this South Asian community. Please join me in welcoming to our program Dr. Indrani Lahiri. Dr. Lahiri is a senior lecturer in media and communication at Demont Ford University. She holds an associate fellowship at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies at the University of London. She is interested in developing interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary research projects within the university nationally and internationally. Her research focuses on digital media, mental health society, and politics. Currently, she is working as co-investigator in several projects on mental health and media. Welcome, Dr. Lahiri. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Next, we have Dr. Orgo Shorkel, quite a familiar face in this community and a very well-known psychiatrist. Dr. Orgo Shorkil is a consultant psychiatrist with more than 25 years of experience in assessing and managing a range of mental health difficulties. He completed all his uh, specialist training in psychiatry in UK, became a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, who not so long ago also awarded Dr. Shorkil with the fellowship. He completed master's in neuroscience with distinction from King's College London, and served as consultant psychiatrist in NHS for many years before he founded Living Mind, an independent mental health organization. 
Living Mind is dedicated to promote an integrated approach in the field of mental health. He's one of the few consultants in UK who has been delivering RTMS or repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a state of the art, non-invasive and drug free treatment for depression, anxiety and many other psychiatric dis disorders. Dr. Sharkel encompasses mindfulness as one of the key interventions in order to facilitate the recovery from various mental disorders. He has also created an album on mindfulness exercise called Mindful Living targeted for different emotional difficulties. A very warm welcome to both of you. We are so pleased and honored to have you both with us today. Uh, without any further delay, let me ask Dr. Shorkil the first question that he has been ever been asked or you know, probably the simplest question he has probably been asked or probably the most difficult one to explain yet. So Dr. Shorkil, what is mental health? And what is the difference between mental health and mental disorder? Are we looking at two faces of the same coin? Oh, thank you. What a great question to start with. And uh, thank you so much for a very kind introduction. Um, and also the great organization by the Dumont University and Sangeet Foundation. Um, and thank you, Indrani, for moderating uh, this fantastic uh, event for a great cause. So when we talk about mental health, I suppose I'll start with a World Health Organization's definition of health. And what the WHO says is that it's a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So it has got an equal importance like physical health. But mental health is essentially is a function of brain that affects our uh, behavior, our emotion, our thoughts. It helps us making decisions in our lives, gives us sense of autonomy, competence. Any activity physically we might be able to engage in, for example, this kind of events, but it's our mental functioning that really gives us the meaning, liking, disliking, appreciating. So it's an integral part of the well-being. So that's uh, the first part of the question. So that's what we mean by when we talk about the mental health. Now, there are a lot of terminologies used in the community, mental illness, mental disease, disorder, and they're often uh, interchangeably used. But disorder is perhaps the word used in more clinical categories. And what we mean by that is a set of clinically recognizable symptoms or behavior. And in most cases, it leads to some kind of distress and it interferes with our personal function, maybe in our social life, maybe in the education who are in the full-time education or in our occupational lives. So, so I suppose that's what we mean by the illness or disease. We just because of some symptoms, that does not necessarily mean for example, we might have been feeling a bit low for a couple of days or we're a bit anxious before exam approaching. That's not necessarily a mental disorder because it's not affecting our functioning significantly. So I hope that I have clarified that what is mental health and what we mean by mental illness or disorder. Yes, Dr. Sharkil, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so quickly moving on to Dr. Lahiri then. To follow on Dr. Sharkil's answer, how do you see mental health as projected by creative arts and performances in the South Asian community? Is it innovated or say created to educate us or to cloud our already confused state of mind? Um, thank you very much, Indrani, and um, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Shawkel's most informed, um, you know, um, kind of discussion. So, um, and it's a very um, relevant and, and interesting question to answer in the sense that, generally speaking, when we talk about uh, mental health and in mental health in movies, you know, it would it won't be right to say that uh, mental health has been always negatively portrayed in the movies. There are some uh, positive portrayals. And of course, people have learned a lot through movies about different mental health conditions. Um, but what is important to, um, to say here is about the negative emotions, because as humans, we tend to think more or um, 
you know, think of more when when it comes to negative emotions. So the the intensity of that thought process is um, is is so so deep. I would say um, that the possibility of retaining that information, that negative information, is much more higher than when we receive compliments and appreciations. You know, so. Think about an example, say, for example, if you're going to a doctor for a, just before a procedure and um, you have been told that there is an 80 percent success rate. So you will be you will not be feeling that much down. You will think, oh, well, 80 percent is quite high a number, you know, whereas if the doctor says to you that there is a 20 percent um, you know, negative outcome that can happen uh, from that procedure, you're going to be much more skeptical. You're going to talk to your uh, family, friends, and you're going to, um, you know, possibly going to land up on Google to find out more information about it. Because, um, you know, research suggests that um, we, as humans, we always look out for some uh, negatives and we find uh, pleasure sometimes in finding them. And there are also studies. Um, that link this to how our brain process information. Um, so since the movies, um, they have given out this message that whenever you have got someone suffering with mental illness within your family, that's going to actually have an impact on, a, on the larger family or uh, on your friends and society at large. Therefore, we seem to retain that information in our brain much more easily. And um, whereas we, we just forget at that point of time that if we see someone having a cardiac arrest in a movie, we don't think that um, we, you know. We, we we don't seem to think more about it because we know that we will go to a, a, a doctor and we are going to find out what's happening and we are, we will get medication. So that's the difference, you know. How movies actually help you to think and retain that negative uh, information in light of uh, mental health. Um, and uh, I think the the. The message going out from the movies has also been recently, in some of the movies, has been uh, recently around why people should go and seek treatment, uh, which is which is quite good. Uh, but on the other hand, if you come back to the creative arts and performances, they are linked to positive outcomes. So when we talk about, say, for example, singing, dancing, music in our society, we don't talk about the therapeutic side of it. But at the same time, you know, we do accept as a common sense narrative that there is a feel good factor when you're drawing or when you're send it, sending your kids to a, a dance school and music. So that's that's the difference, you know. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Obviously, you know, every there's so much to learn every day. It also actually reminds me of a quote by the famous poet Alfred Lord Tennyson, who said so many worlds, so much to do, so little is done, so such things to be. Thank you. So let us quickly just introduce the three topics that our eminent panelists chose to talk, talk about today. The three topics are grief, autism, and suicide, the myth and realities encompassing these three words. Uh, coming to you then again, Dr. Shorkil, uh, our sure. first topic today is, so let's start with grief, an everyday yes. term used most flippantly in our homes on a daily basis. My question is, can you please explain the term grief from a psychiatrist's perspective and help us understand the term for what it really is? Yes, and I'm glad that you asked this question because it's such a common terminology, such a common uh, occurrence in our lives at some phases. Uh, we use the term grief, we use the term loss, bereavement, uh, but it's it's a reaction of our mind following any loss uh death doesn't have to be death all the time sometimes even near death experiences but what i like to describe grief as is an emotional journey following any kind of loss or impending loss it's a mental functioning that starts adapting to this change in our social life in our psychological aspects so the first thing to clarify, I'm moving on from the first question, that grief itself is not a mental illness or a disorder. It's very important for the community to be aware that it's a normal psychological process, it's a normal emotional journey following any loss. 
So it is not a mental disorder. So what the uh, the first and if you look into the online or different textbooks, uh, but most of the time there are three or four main stages that we talked about. And the first one is often as soon as we hear the news, it's a shock. Sometimes the dial is too difficult to absorb the reality. So our mental functioning goes into the denial mode. And then it's almost like a disbelief. It hasn't happened. Oh, no, no, it's, you know, you're joking. So we hear all those. So that's the first stage, the shock, denial, disbelief. And then we get into slightly a different mode. Uh, we become angry sometimes. We can be angry at ourselves. We can be angry at persons who left us. Or sometimes we can see some angry reaction towards professionals or other people involved in a person's care. Uh, so the mind starts bargaining. Oh, wish I could do that. Perhaps I could have saved. And that's called bargaining stage. It's very, very common. And again, it's not a disorder. It's a very normal stage of grief. Understandably, uh, there's a deepened sadness. Mood becomes low. And again, just to clarify for the viewers and listeners and that this depression is not an illness. It's a part of the normal grief reaction. But through that, slowly, our mental functioning tries to reconstruct and walk through in our thoughts in order to accept that sad event, that which is a reality. And interestingly, although it is known as very distressing, but at the last stage of grief, after the accept acceptance, there is some installation of hope. So sure. bereavement actually is quite a healthy process, healthy way to digest a very traumatic event in our lives. But it is very important that someone goes through that. And our aim, not just the professionals, but particularly the family, the near and dear ones, allow people to facilitate this process, the natural grief. And most of the time, we are quite successful in that. But of course, uh, I'm sure we'll touch on that in the media aspects that our presentations very significantly from person to person, depending on our cultural experience, expectation, society, the level of attachment, current circumstances, where we have to just get on with the things. Uh, so it's not all set in stone. And the stages can vary the duration of each stage that I've just described. So that okay. what so far I talked about is really the normal grief reaction. Uh, but sometimes these reactions go on for a year, two years, three years. And that's what we talk about pathological grief. Then it starts bordering on some of the mental illnesses, for example, depressive disorder. Sometimes it can be post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it can lead on to harmful use of alcohol or drugs. People find it difficult to cope. So sometimes that becomes their final crutch, if you like. And so it's very important to be dis to distinguish between the normal grief reaction and the pathological grief reaction. But the help is available. So it can start from someone near and dear ones we can confide in. Maybe from their own assessment by professionals, talking therapy, often counseling can be enough. But if needed, there can be a role of medications. So these are the conditions where help is available and help is effective. I think this is the key thing. But the grief in general is not it's a normal reaction of mind following someone's loss. OK? OK, Dr. Sharkel, thank you so much. Um, obviously, that was the, uh, the psychiatrist's perspective. So let's just go right across to the media's perspective. So Dr. Lahiri, just while, uh, you know, even listening to Dr. Shortkale, the first image that probably unknowingly just came to my mind um, is a movie that I watched a few years back that I was absolutely overwhelmed by. And just as Dr. Shortkale was describing, this is something, you know, it was an image that actually popped into my mind. The film I think you will know is Manchester by the Sea, a very moving, moving film. And I remember reading quite a few uh, rave reviews about it. So just keeping that movie in perspective, do you believe that that was the true projection of the emotion we call 
grief was that properly projected by the media yeah um thank you indrani and i think i will start from uh, where dr shaukel left and uh, you know where he was you know at, at the beginning linking it back to his where he started about the denial process you know that people want to go back to so um and and the movie that you're mentioning here is very relevant to that you know when uh, it is a it is a i think manchester by the sea is a classic example of um right you know how we how we accept and go through the experience of loss in our family and also the PTSD which is like the post traumatic um, stress disorder so we as audience have uh, for generations now accepted that um, you know the dramatic scripts will, uh, will come when it comes to the portrayal of mental health conditions in movies but after watching this film you know i personally think that manchester by sea is a very good uh, example of of uh, cinematic realism uh, when it comes to the believability of the characters and events that happens throughout the movie so we watch movies as it brings us that unique aesthetic experience you know on one hand but also we love to experience that tension when we are you know um, in in that space and we try to understand the underlying messages from the um from the perceptual prompts so manchester by the sea is a unique is unique in feeding the audience with those prompts and as a result we feel the heartbreaking experiences that lee goes through in that movie Absolutely, absolutely. And the whole movie, you know, if you, if you remember, it centers around Lee, his frustrations, his, um, you know, his uh, his body language has been so so well, um, you know, it, it pulls together the that grief, guilt, whatever you bring there. So originally in the movie, Lee comes as a shy and as a very lonely boy. However, uh, we see his gradual development as an angry young man. Who is more self-destructive, you know? So the movie shows us as difficult thoughts comes to Lee and how he links it to his past experiences, and at the same time, the movie also reminds us how we distance ourselves from the past that we do not want to face, you know. And that's a very important message that that movie carries back to the audiences. Um, we the 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 movie um, reminds us that you know however you want to uh, move away from that past at some point in your life you will have to face that past you know and we um experience you know in our daily lives we experience grief in many ways and coping mechanisms they vary from person to person so the audience can surely relate very well to the portrayal of grief in in this movie manchester by the sea so um you know some of the examples would be like you know normally in a movie uh, we don't expect a baby crying at a funeral scene but here we do mm. see it happening you know and as it happens in our our daily life as well the movie also shows how alcohol and drug can impact thought and the devastation it can bring not only to individuals but their families you know so we got a little bit of a context around the substance abuse perspective here um we also see the guilt and the action immediately after um you know in the police station when lee uh, tries to kill himself after the confession you know when the police don't take him to the prison which he desperately wanted so the guilt that he carries throughout then is portrayed through the actions that he takes as a self punishment but i think the grief in the movie has got lots to tell him uh tell tell the audience actually um about toxic masculine triangle as well you know where we see okay. him refusing to seek and accept help and therefore we see the pain that the character goes through interestingly i have also um you know in in daily lives come across people who mentioned how this movie brought back their memory of guilt whether that be in the park when their child got hurt or as um they were on phone browsing something uh, um and that moment um they were you know crossing the road and there was a fear of near miss and that kind of thing so anyways the reason i brought these examples is to show how we as audience could link our own life experiences when a movie portrays it 
realistically. So it's very important, you know, when we watch a movie that we understand the underlying message and we try to also, um, you know, have a look around or ask the experts about what, um, you know, what message you have received and how, how far that's uh, relevant. Um, and towards the end of this movie, again, interestingly, we see when we, uh, when um, not towards the end, but towards the middle, actually, when Lee met his ex-wife, the body language told a lot about that grief, pain and memory, which we um, in daily lives, you know, we experience that. We see some of our friends or family members in that kind of state. So, yes. Yeah, so, you know, if you ask me as an audience, can I link to it? Yes, I did link to it, and it was a very well researched um, uh, movie, um, especially looking into the PTSD and the grief um, area. Absolutely, I mean, it's it's a film that you know would give everybody something to talk about, some reason, and there's something in it that each and every one of us can uh, relate to. And I think what re reminds what I'm reminded right now is a phrase my professor in presidency college she would always reiterate is that. Um, it's perfectly okay to say you are not okay. I think, I mean, we can go on and on, you know, talking about uh, this for why one session, we can have millions of sessions on this and we probably will still not get enough. So I am just going to maybe move on to the second topic and for the day that we had decided on was autism. So Dr. Lairi, I'll still continue with you for this. Again, just because we are talking of films, I think there are many films, especially in the Indian cinema, cinema context, South Asian context, that have been made on this topic. Some have highlighted it for the right reasons, while some, I believe, have used this topic to play on the emotions of the people. Uh, let's take, for example, something, a film that's very close to all our hearts, say, a Tari Zameen Par or Bhagfi, you know, these kind of films. Uh, do you think that media takes advantage of the myth that we have about autism prevalent in society? And, you know, do, do you again believe then that media plays on our, um, you know, on the misconceptions that we have and plays it to their advantage? Well, again, you know, I think you have done a real justice to the to the question here by bringing in those two films. Uh, and I think these are the two films that have helped the South Asian audience to think and take actions, you know. So both are very good examples, as I think the first one is a very well-researched movie. And the second one reinforced a lot of stereotypes, you know, um, apart from, uh, of course, the portrayal of, of autism and, and how uh, they have brought that into the film. But there were some stereotypes, which we'll, I, I will come to it, uh, come back to it in a minute. But the first one, um, you know, is more educational because it helps parents to to connect and understand. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I came across parents who tried to label their child based on the impression that they got from this movie. You know, so where they have been observing their their child and they have been thinking that, oh, well, you know, there is something wrong with my child, possibly. Um, my child is autistic, you know, so that kind of impression, that kind of, um, you know, um, uh, what I say, um, you know, a, a thought that comes to a parent by actually looking at a movie, not going to a professional, um, to the doctor to ask, you know, about what's going on, not clarifying the position, I think is dangerous as well. So um, that's one of the negative things that I thought that came across quite a lot uh, from within the community as well. Um, the second one is much more interesting, where we um, sat for three hours to only, um, to, to only learn the othering or clustering of differently abled people, meaning they're not welcome in um, so-called normal cluster, thus making us believe that they are uh, abnormal or mad, you know, and and and. The, the word mad has been has been very often used in connection to differently abled people, you know, and it has got um, social and cultural implications as well. So um, as we see that we can we can get mixed messages going out from these movies. And of course, as always, it depends on the audience to accept verify or reject. But Taris Aminpur, which means um, stars upon the ground, brings in the neurocognitive element of creativity. 
And I've seen parents um, uh, comforting themselves with the idea that if a child is autistic, then they have a talent. Now, this generalization um, is possibly not true. And Dr. Shokel can come on this, you know, from a, from a more medical perspective, as I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to comment on that. But for this movie, the context of dyslexia was brought in very well. So where we see how the family struggles to cope, understand, and how to how a continuous comparison between siblings make it worse for the child, you know. And it does happen, you know, it comes very much, you know, it portrays very much of a real um, situation here. And uh, in the movie, we also see how parents find it difficult to learn about the situation. And in the beginning, again, in the, we find them in a state of denial, you know, uh, and they oh. completely disregard the advice uh, from the art, uh, from, from the art teacher. Um, interestingly, the movie also brings in the training requirement for educational professionals in schools and the pedagogical demands for inclusive education. Now, there are both um, verbal and non-verbal difficulties. And again, this can be explained by more by Dr. Shorkel. This is not my area of expertise at all. Um, but I think we need to we need to understand it uh, from that professional background rather than we understanding it from the movie background, you know, uh, or, or the message that we get. And then we think it from that, take it from that light. Now, regarding Barfi, it was received by the audience more from the acting perspective rather than the mental illness, I would say. Although Burfi opened up conversations within the community around emotions, uh, relationships, and special needs, it also reinforced the idea that they need special schooling away from the mainstream, which I think that professionals need a bit more to think about. The movie acts definitely on the presumption that differently abled people experience a sorrowful life and tries to bring in hope. It is definitely difficult to accurately depict autistic behaviors as it involves a wide spectrum. So, again, you know, these are some of the areas possibly um, Dr. Shorkel um, can help us understand more. Yeah, I think the important thing that you really picked up on over there, Dr. Lahiri, is the idea of othering, you know, where they are actually set and made to, into a different uh, part, being part of society, yet probably removed in a way. So Dr. Shorkel has been sitting nice and quiet for a while now. So I'm going to get back to you, Dr. Shorkel. Sure. Uh, so I could ask a very simple question, something you've been asked probably, you know, every day of your job as a psychiatrist is just give me a simple definition of autism. And what are the telltale signs that a layman like me, you know, should be looking for, whether we are looking for, you know, such signs in, a, in children or in adults? Easy but right. most yes, and uh, I'll, I like your quotation about it's perfectly okay to say you are not okay. And yeah. I'll probably go one step forward to say it's perfectly okay to be different. And I think that's yeah. what autism describes. Uh, and mm. this is where the mo movies can make a slightly different impression. So what is autism, right? So autism essentially, it's a developmental disorder. There is no doubt if someone has got what we know commonly called childhood autism. And the reason we say childhood autism, because the developmental disorder actually starts manifesting even before age of three years. So you can see it's a very early on, uh, we can see a uh, number of different delays. It could uh, involve speech and language, uh, other development delays. And uh, there are three main domains uh, where uh, autistic uh, children or even adults are different than others. And uh, those are, the social interaction is very different. Um, their communication style is very different and often they engage in very restricted and repetitive behavior. Uh, without going into very technical details, uh, we do know that there are some physiological and anatomical variations when study brain or the function or their circulations inside the brain and that has been proven time and time again uh, but uh, but these are the three main ones and boys uh, tend to suffer approximately three to four times more than the girls okay. and and there are different types of autism 
Uh, and of course, it starts with children, but sometimes for different reasons, it gets not neglected, but doesn't come to uh, the professionals or doesn't get recognized. And then they tend to have an impact when we grow up into adult lives, into our education, into your social lives, in our workplaces. So it is very important uh, not to, of course, prejudge and not to stereotype, as Dr. Larry said. It's very important that if we do see that perhaps they're different, think about it, talk to the professionals. Maybe that is fine. This is just a normal variation of the development. It may not have nothing to do with the autism, but it's very important rather than non-professionals labeling them as autism inappropriately. Uh, it's important to know what's going on in child's mental health or more accurately, perhaps, in the developmental aspects. So, and, and I want to bring again this concept of, is it an illness or not? And I think this is often being talked about. So, like as I said, that just because someone has got one or two symptoms, that does not make it a disorder as such. But we have to have some, some of us might have some traits, very mild. So sometimes we call autistic traits. So, so that is why the professional assessment will tease out that is it just presence of few traits or actually someone is suffering from autistic disorder. Uh, sometimes there is difficult to classify because there are different types of uh, autism. Uh, some people with autism are higher functioning than others. And again, coming back to what Dr. Riley's point that uh, you know, children or oh, just because someone is autistic means they're more intelligent or they're specially abled. That's not necessarily the case for, you know, any uh, children or adults with autistic spectrum disorders, because yes, some of them are, and some of them are develop special interests. Uh, for example, knowing all the telephone numbers of the friends and families by heart, say for example. So they've got those, you know, special abilities but they still have those core domains that need to be addressed for example uh picking up the social cues what we call as a social reciprocity so when we talk about something normally we know how to react if someone is talking about the sad things perhaps we are not really very jubilant so that kind of emotional interaction is missing uh, I'm sure that, uh, you know, in the internet, there is, uh, people have read about the concept of theory of mind. And that is what is one of the uh, difficulties that autistic uh, children or even the adults, they suffer. Essentially, what it means is they have very different cognitive abilities to understand that if I say certain things, or if I behave in certain things, what kind of emotions it could be evoked in others. But that is mainly what his theory of mind is. Uh, so because of that, they have difficulty in communication in the society, normally what we would expect uh, amongst ourselves. So uh, we may have heard about uh, Asperger's syndrome, say for example. So that is one of the high functioning autism where the main difference is usually they do not have any speech or language delay but most of the other autistic disorders or spectrum disorders, they do have some uh, much more severe sort of delays, including speech and language. And again, dyslexia. So this is again, another important thing. We might label them with uh, autism, but they might have other problems. For example, ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, it is uh, often we see that there is a combination of those two disorders present. So it's very important to do the assessment and that will give us the clue what's the right way forward. So uh, it's, and, and coming back to the stereotypy that particularly sometimes in the movies or in the society we'll see is not just the children or adults, is the family and the near and dear ones. So they need support. Uh, you know, societies like National Autistic Society is a, is a fantastic organization. Uh, it's, uh, they have got the free helpline. Uh, they've got a very good website. Uh, you know, we are often become the victims of shame, isolation, rejection, bullying. So it's very important to support not only uh, people with autism, but also the family, the near and dear ones. Uh, and coming back to the same point, 
help is available. Uh, please, please ask for help. It's important to untangle what's exactly going on because that will only give us a clue what's the right way forward to improve their quality of functioning because that's our ultimate goal. It's not just about treating the symptoms. So, and just finally, before I finish off uh, regarding autism, it's very important to know that sometimes they can also have other symptoms. For example, uh, obsession, intense interest, repetitive, intrusive thoughts about different things, rituals. Uh, so that can get exaggerated, particularly during this COVID pandemic. I think, you know, people find it very difficult. The routine is out of the window. Uh, so, and again, that may not be the OCD as such, but it can be part and parcel of the autism itself. But they can have other disorders like depression, anxiety, like anyone else. So hence, it is so important uh, to come for the professional help, proper assessment by psychiatrists or psychologists, or sometimes a combination of the two professionals uh, gives us uh, the right guidance, really, that how to help the children, adults, or their near and dear ones. Absolutely. That's brilliant, Dr. Shorkil. I mean, I think what I need to kind of just bring in here and reiterate to the viewers is that it is something that can definitely be managed with professional health. I think what is important is to get assessed and seek the help to improve our day-to-day uh, -day functioning. You know, you can contact the NHS. I mean, I'm sure Dr. Shorkil will be more than happy to help if he is contacted or any professional. Just be comfortable and make sure you take the right decision. And the first step always is seek help. And it's never too late. I believe it's never too late. Wow, that was quite interesting. So uh, I think I'm just going to come to the last topic for the evening. Uh, I'll come to you, Dr. Lahiri, is that uh, it's, I have always you know, been very intrigued by the way uh, media has used this last topic of ours, which is you know, suicide. So. Uh, I've been very intrigued by the way media has uh, used this act of suicide to play on the vulnerability of the human emotions. Just to give you an example, let's take a brilliant film that touched the heart of millions, Three Idiots. What I distinctly remember as a result, I mean, if it was a brilliant film, you know, there's no two ways about it. We all enjoyed every bit of it. But what I remember is as a result of the film were the um, innumerable attempts made by students in the South Asian community to perfectly enact the scene and meet their end. When met with the slightest crisis, it felt almost as if the film was trying to give you a solution, which was actually not a solution in my understanding. Do you think this was a very uh, responsible depiction by the media, keeping in mind how vulnerable our young minds are? Um. Thank you. It's a very um, good question, and and I think if you say if you if you ask this question in regard to whether it was portrayed rightly or whether the movie okay. should have done this, now you know as we started with the first question, you know, on the mental health and portrayal of of um, certain things or mental illness in the movie, I think it will take me back to that point because of course um, you know when it comes to uh, movies. Um, they have a budget, you know, and they have a market and, and they want to reach out to audience and they want to sell it. So there is, there is not just a social angle. So the social responsibility angle is there, yes, but there is also a market angle um, in any, any movies. There is a business angle. Um, so therefore, I'm not going to comment whether they have done it right or wrong, but I think when we are talking about suicide in movies, we should bring it out as something, not as a, you know, that, that, that is not something as a as an easy solution that people can adapt to, you know. So I think in, in three idiots, what happened was that we, we saw both attempted and successful suicide in that movie. Now, the movie brings in a lot of social socioeconomic problem, and it also shows that the parents are desperate um, to take decisions on behalf of their children. Um, it is a great portrayal of frustrations that um, then emerge out of these high expectations that impacts mental health. We need to remember at this point that uh, building resilience is so important when it comes to the overall development of a child. 
we worry a lot um, about the future of our child and forget to leave in the present. And that's important, I think. That, that was the message possibly three idiots came to its audiences, um, which, um, you know, which, which is perfectly right, really. Um, and you you did mention about um, the suicides. Yes, in 2010, I remember that there were a series of attempts, and you know, of course, um, they were devastating for the families and everything. But the question really comes back to the family life and um, to the educational, um, you know, uh, responsibilities. I would say. So it is important to understand that we as parents cannot possibly guard our child when they become adults. But if we teach the lessons of resilience building, um, then we do not need to worry about their future, you know, in that way. So coming back to the movie, the suicides in this movie happens as a result of that pressure, you know, and, and the continuous grinding fed by the high expectations. Three here carefully manages to bring the concept of critical thinking and application as opposed to the bookish knowledge, you know. So it questions whether, you know, just reading from the book makes you a better engineer or actually experimenting makes you a better um, engineer. And, and that's quite important. So it is not about the how one responds to the crisis, but also how we recover and build after is important. And, um, you know, as it, as it builds the logic and helps us look at a situation more objectively. So um, we have witnessed many incidents linked to academic pressure, bullying, etc., which Dr. Schorkel also referred to in the, in the context of autism. Um, and um, it, we, we have seen this in, in, in connection to higher education globally. So in a way, 3 d does build on that conversation. There are, of course, different other factors that contribute to the ending of um, life decisions. And Dr. Schorkel will be able to guide us more on the medical side of it, I believe. Um, but one last point I would like to um, make here is um, the challenges that we will face, we will all face in the future from social media, you know? So we we know there have been cases and we not need to do more research in that area and we need to be mindful about social media and understand that social media, you know, and take and understand social media as a business model. Yes, I think uh, what we keep coming back to on our discussions is follow the seven C's of resilience. Resilience is so important and for the viewers, understand, teach and learn. I think we all need to learn as adults first and teach the children the seven C's of resilience. Uh, coming to Dr. Shorkin then, uh, you know, obviously it is our last topic. I can see that we've already flown through a lot and there are questions to take and Joyce Ray is waiting over there with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I can't let you go before I ask you my last question and something that, you know, it keeps going on in my head all the time is uh, social, obviously, you know, with all that is going around in social media, one, one term that we seem to have immense clarity about, unfortunately, is suicide. You know, we seem to know it all, but is that true? So my question to you, Dr. Shorkel, is and something that I think many people must have asked you before is, when someone commits suicide, what are the last thoughts that would be going through, you know, that person's mind, you know, a suicidal person? Does he actually believe that he is relieving himself from the pain that he's going through? Or does he do it because he has no knowledge of a better option? You know, does he, it's just, is it that he has no other, he knows no better? Or that is his only option, you know, killing himself or, you know, meeting his end because that's going to relieve his pain. Uh, yes, and uh, I'm glad you talked about the resilience and, uh, you know, uh, and the suicide. They just go hand in hand, really, because, uh, I mean, to answer the first question about what exactly goes in people's mind before they take this tragic decision, uh, it's uh, uh, most of the research is as unfortunately suicide is something which is a non-repeatable event. So we have seen when we have last seen them, uh, whether as a psychiatrist or any mental health professionals, uh, what the research tells us that is an immense hopelessness, a very deep sense of helplessness. And that lead to this intense and immediate desire to exit. So those are the three things. It's almost like a triangle. And when that happens, 
then they are left with very little choice. Uh, and of course, it's a very tragic and complex phenomenon. And I would say, particularly in the context of this media and movie, I think it gets even the way it is reported or way that it is portrayed, it becomes even more complex. And that is why I think it's very important. I'm glad that you asked these questions and we're talking about it. Because a huge number of factors play a part, either in isolation or in combination. Uh, unrecognized mental illnesses like depression, and we do know because of the stigma, because of the pressure, uh, you know, we try not to think like a physical illness. If it is diabetes, high blood pressure, we wouldn't shy away from go and get the help. Uh, but with the depression, feeling sad, feeling hopeless, lots of pressures not to seek help. And, uh, and I'm hoping that this kind of discussions, the viewers and listeners will uh, become more aware that help is available. Uh, it could potentially, but the risk will be minimized or in many cases it could be prevented. So it's sure. important to understand and rather than speculating on things that we do not know and we do know recently that has happened, uh, so, so yes, as I said, that when I talked about various number of factors playing a part, lack of social support is one of the key factors, particularly when someone goes through that phase of hopelessness. That's the last time, you know, we want to take, you know, take help away from them. Role of alcohol and drugs, I cannot emphasize enough, it, it's sometimes it just leads from bad to worse. So it is important, again, to think about what are the different coping mechanisms coming back to the resilience really that help is available uh, for example conditions like depression are treatable conditions so if we can treat the conditions and if suicidal thoughts are the symptoms so it's a no-brainer to understand that those symptoms will subside with the correct treatment and therefore these fatal outcomes could be prevented uh, but i want to uh, just uh, give few figures just to understand, particularly in the Southeast Asian concept, that, uh, for example, in India, uh, is the highest suicidal rate amongst the whole Southeast Asia, and is around 16.5 per 100,000 population per year. is the sixth highest in the world. So it's a staggering figure. And unfortunately, uh, males tend to be twice likely to... Um, uh, engage in that behavior. Sorry, I'm quite conscious about not using the word committing suicide. I understand it's in media is quite a lot. So, but to engage in that kind of behavior. And I want to spend a, just a minute about the patriarchal society, uh, because why uh, the men are more likely to engage in this behavior. And what we know from patriarchal society that men have primary power, that's an expectation, predominance in the leadership, social privileges, moral authority, the, the control over the property, money, uh, which is quite prevalent in the uh, Southeast Asia. So they try to live up to this expectation from the society. So so-called success is judged from these domains. If we can't perform, seen as a failure. And that depends the sense of isolation. Negative thoughts about oneself and the world around them creep in slowly. Self-esteem gets lower and lower. Motivation goes down. Mood becomes lower and lower. So the, my appeal that please ask for help. Start confiding in to someone you trust. It doesn't have to be professional to begin with. Then get help from professionals, assessment, accepting treatment. And this is exactly my point. And I'm so glad Dr. Lai touched on that. That movies are perhaps very good in talking about the importance of understanding, recognizing symptoms. But I think that media should have more responsibility also to talking about building resilience and the solutions. As soon as we're portraying the problems, it's equally important what can be done about it rather than leaving problems as a problems. And I think that will be my appeal to the community. We all have individual and collective responsibility to work towards it, to fight against the stigma so that people do not have to engage in this very sad or tragic behavior to take their life. So that's what I'll say about the suicide. Absolutely, I think uh, that's brilliant. I mean, with everything that's happening around, the most important thing that we need to keep in mind is knowledge. And 
you know, this was a brilliant session. And I think what we have to get across is, again, something that comes to my head right now is a Kofi Annan uh, quote where he says, knowledge is power. Information is liberating. Education is the premise of the progress in every society and every family. So dear viewers, the first thing, please keep in mind now that you have the knowledge from this session, it's been a brilliant session. We still have time for some questions that we are going to take from uh, Joy Sada. But now that you have the knowledge, please make use because of the power that comes with this knowledge. You have had two eminent panelists giving you, you know, imparting their knowledge to you. My only request to you would be seek help. It is never too late. And of course, you have Sangeet Foundation to come fall back on who have been fighting for this cause forever. Dr. Sharkel and Dr. Lahiri will obviously be you know, willing to answer any further questions. Uh, I, I can see we have quite a few questions coming up and Jantada has been waiting for a while. So it's over to you, Jantada, now uh, to ask the questions from the viewers. Right. So thank you, Indrani Bhattacharya, because I have to, because we have got two Indranis over here, Dr. Lairi and Ms. Bhattacharya. So thank you for that. Um, just in case, before I go to the questions, just in case you are wondering why I was singing that song in the beginning. So what was the context behind it? Right. So and this song says, Magar hai zindagi, fir bhi mujhe tujse muhabbat hai. So everybody loves life. And when we talk it in context of suicide, you wonder why would anybody do that? And that is what was so brilliantly explained by Dr. Sharkhill about, you know, what triggers people, you see. So one of the lines in that, and this is a song from a movie called Harjai by, and sung by Kishore Kumar, brilliantly sung by Kishore Kumar. And uh, there's a line in that which says, Ujalo ki zarurat hai, andhera meri kismat hai. So we need light to lead us into the future. We need that. But do we need to surrender to darkness? Andhera meri kismat hai, is that my destiny? I think we have addressed that question that it need not be our destiny. We need to seek help. And that is very important. So we in Sangeet Foundation believe that there is always hope and way forward. And uh, in Sangeet Foundation, we believe in happiness through music and the arts. And uh, thank you so much, Indrani, for Indrani Lahiri, Dr. Lahiri, for having us, you know, partner with you. So, um, so there are a couple of questions, given the fact that, you know, we have almost run out of time. A couple of questions we have. One question says, um, now our children are spending huge amount of time on smart device watching cartoons. How can a child develop their mental health using smart device? So can it be a detriment or how can we leverage that to increase our mental health using the smart devices? Dr. Sharkin. Right. Uh, um, very common uh, sort of observation. I wouldn't want to say necessarily it's a problem. And it's like anything else, really, because uh, this is the way of life these days. Uh, children, uh, even adults. Uh, we spend a lot of time on the smart uh, devices and it does serve um, a lot of positive, um, um, there are a lot of positive aspects. So what I'd say that spending time appropriately with the proper guidance and in terms of maintaining mental health, I think it's important, one big source is internet is available, especially with smart device. So getting the right information with the right guidance. So parental guidance is absolutely vital. So whenever it is appropriate to have that PG or the parental guidance to be on, uh, to, to filter that, uh, because um, unfortunately one of the problems with the internet is uh, information quality is, you know, it can be, it, it varies a lot. And we do not want a child to grow up um, believing in things those are not uh, necessarily accurate or correct. Uh, so it's important uh, for parents to have an understanding what sort of things, particularly uh, the children, uh, you know, who are observing. So spending more time, particularly now when they can't go to the school, some of them at least, uh, is very difficult what they can do. So engaging them with a behavior that does not involve a smart device, but also involve smart device. Uh, I must say that, uh, for example, hand-eye coordination is often I know that people play on games. 
And there have been some studies that, yes, it can improve the hand-eye coordination, but at the same time, it increases screen time, does have a adverse effect on the sleep quality. So you can see immediately that there are uh, risks and benefits like anything else. So I don't want to categorize that is a bad thing, but also I don't want to necessarily ask them to indulge into more and more media. As long as it is used appropriately, supervised, guided by the adults around them, it can be a good thing. Getting the right information, uh, getting into some games, uh, getting into something which is important to uh, their their procedural, their, their memory can be improved. So for example, a lot of memory games, uh, uh, a number of educational topics. So using those in a positive way, and of course, making sure they are not using it inappropriately or observing something is inappropriate for their age. So which brings us to a very important question, and it's a follow up on that from my perspective, is there was this game called the Blue Whale. And yes. that seemed to that seems to be what they classified as a suicide game where they would trigger people to 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 you know take that extreme step what is your opinion about that yes and particularly now that we know uh, unfortunately i do know that uh, some of them you know they're uh, engaged into that suicidal behavior and we lost them which is very tragic but at least in the view of that information we have it is very important to make children aware rather than shying away from talking about it because children are actually a lot more mature than what we think they are. So, you know, if we don't tell them, they will get to know from other sources. So it is important to tell them appropriate to their age that what is important in case some of them are also feeling sad or hopeless, help is available rather than necessarily associating with that as a solution. So it is important to talk to them constructively, of course, appropriate for the rage. What we last thing you want to mystify it or to tell something which is inaccurate or just completely banning it without telling them why. So it is important, of course, not to encourage them playing in that kind of games, but it's important to explain why. Because then only we can reinforce a positive behavior. Because it is yeah. possible children can understand. But of course, we have to come down to their level. And we have to make it explain. And if professional help is needed, so be it. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharkil, for that. The next question, and it links back to this question, is, uh, and this I will uh, lead to Dr. Lahiri. And um, so can movies act as triggers? Like we talked about this blue whale being a trigger, maybe a possible trigger. Can movies be a trigger for the positive and the negative? You know, whether you know to take them to the right direction or even to take you know wrong steps what what is your opinion give, coming from media well i think yes i mean um, you know as as the games or as as the social media forums can actually um sometimes you know you've you've seen possibly read stories about how in the social media there are like grooming sessions happening so it's more kind of the emotional appeal isn't it so movies do have emotional appeal and because that many films transmit ideas through emotions you know rather than intellect they can neutralize the ins instinct to suppress that feeling and trigger that emotional release you know and that can be um, perceived by the person who is receiving it in a very negative light so um, yes um, in, in one way movies can be um, the instigator but what I would like to also mentioned here is that we when we watch movie we need to always understand that again it's a part of a business and also that movies are not a real thing that's happening you know all those stories may be taken from someone's lives but there are always you know um, the building blocks you know put on top of the stories the real stories that actually um, gets portrayed in that movie because a movie is about you know at least uh, two to three hours long you know when it comes to Bollywood movies so I would say um, we need to verify facts when we watch movie just watch it as a movie you know so I had once a cardiac surgeon who was saying like if you go into a movie and uh, a comedy movie and you laugh it's a kind of cardiac um, 
exercise and it's very good for health so it, it does the same kind of benefit as you um if you go to a gym you know um so similarly when you feel sad and you try to link that emotion that you see in the film to your life you know that's the negative thing that's the negative information that we are retaining in our brain so it's the brain so it's kind of training the brain immediately after saying that that's a movie and that needs to be left in that screen um if there is uh, there is any harmful thoughts that you know comes but of course i mean when people are in in that kind of situation um that kind of logic doesn't come uh, all the time so uh, we need to watch out um of course as parents you know if if children are watching movies that can actually bring in some of those contexts i would say thank you for that dr rai last two questions um interesting ones and this is both for dr sarkil okay so putting him on the spot right now <laughs> my, so one question is my child plays well and is very energetic but does not talk he is 3 years old is he autistic so that's exactly what we are talking about so we are just here picking up maybe one uh hint that there's a Uh, speech and language delay and as we as i said under the when we discussed about the autism that uh, is only uh, it is is very difficult to uh, with the limited information it's difficult to say yes or no uh, so what i'd say that if there is no uh, problem in terms of social communication at the child's age uh, usually interacting well no behavior Uh, of course i can't rule it out without uh, doing the assessment what i'll suggest that uh, is definitely looks like there's a speech and language delay so uh, i would suggest is better to go to the gp first and if possible to get an assessment done specifically by a pediatrician followed by a speech and language therapist so there will be an in depth assessment of the language delay and within those assessments it would be picked up if there are if there is an underlying autistic pathology is there uh, but uh, so it's it's hard to comment you know yes or no in that but doesn't have to be necessarily autistic just because he's not talking by the time that he is 3 years old right thank you and uh, something like that has been portrayed in parameter like agdin by opornashan as well where you know the child is yes. not developed so there can be various reasons for that absolutely yes thank you for that the last question is actually a follow up on your whatever you said earlier about uh males the number of high number of males are being at risk and in a patriarchal society yes so the question is if male patriarch patriarch society is the cause for high number of males uh taking their lives should we look to make family structures more of a partnership right yeah okay uh it's uh obviously i must mention that when i talked about patriarchal society is only one of the contributing factors uh, one shouldn't assume that that is the only cause towards the uh, increased uh, predominance of male suicides uh, there are lots of other factors but i just thought because we are talking about the south asian community it's a community event so it's important to touch on that so that is not the one as only one aspect uh in terms of uh the solution i think i'll come back to this uh, dr lahri t- talked about the resilience uh yes of course we could look into the family structures uh of a more of a partnership yes it, it's a good idea but having said that to convert the patriarchal society to perhaps less patriarchal it will take time is not so easy because there's a huge expectation and it's uh, but if we are all uh working towards it perhaps yes so to make the family structures more of a partnership do will do one thing to take the pressure at least uh, slightly less on um, you know and we are taking responsibility for our family to and then there is not the huge expectation but as i said that that will take time and that is why i talked about is our individual responsibility is also collective responsibility and particularly for this event i think it should be media should be also looking into that when they do the movies uh, this kind of solutions should come out in the movie rather than leaving it just as a problem thank you so much for that dr shortish sure. and uh, i would hand it over 
to Dr. Indrani Lahiri to for the closing comments. I think we are at almost at an end. Um, yes. Yeah, we are we are a couple of minutes running over. Um, but yeah, it's a fascinating discussion, I believe, and and lots to learn and lots to discuss, you know, going forward as well. So I will invite like audience who have actually um, listened to us today. If you want to get, uh, stay connected, uh, please um, do um, talk to us. And then there are um, emails, of course, if you want to get in touch with us. Now, thank you very much all here in the studio. Now you can't see um, Sandra and James who has done a fascinating job now from the backstage and uh, great, great, um, you know, organizing everything during the, um, uh, during, during this event. So not to forget them, uh, not to forget Adam who has helped and trained us to make this happen. And Manavu Sav is actually happening for the first time to celebrate South Asian um, Heritage Month. Uh, so we are trying to work on building community resilience. And um, again, um, that brings back to the discussion that we did today. So many thanks to Indrani Bhattacharya for a very thoughtful moderation. And it helped us to talk and you know the, the links were fantastic. And my heartiest thanks to Dr. Shorkill from Living Mind and Jayant Roy, uh, founder of Sangit Foundation, for the great event yesterday and making it possible today as well. So Sangit Foundation is one of our partners um, and uh, more to come in the in the coming weeks. So we have got Elixir coming up next week and then we have got an Indian summer. Then we've got children's stories and celebrate our similarities. So the whole of July, we are going to have, um, you know, going to go live every Fridays and Saturdays between 4 and 5 p.m. And uh, we have also received interest from our audiences and possibly on July 17th, we will be bringing in those performances live to you all. And thank you all for being so supportive of Manavutsav and follow us on Facebook for regular updates and links. And um, our Facebook page is called Manavutsa Digital. So thank you again um, to everyone here uh, with us here and um, there in the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.